just where do we stand as far as our economy is concerned. If you ask Abhijit Banerjee, the Nobel laureate, the economy is doing very badly. The economic data is dubious, consumption has gone down. On the other hand, the government believes that yes, there may be challenges at the moment, but the broader macroeconomic situation is stable and that basic demand will pick up. The economy is doing very badly, in my view. Um, it's, uh, if you, one of the numbers that just came out is the, uh, the National Sample Survey, which comes out every one and a half years or so, and it's a, 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 it gives you the average consumption in urban and rural areas in India. And the fact that we see in that is that between 2014, 15, and 2017, 18, that number has slightly gone down. And that's the first time such a thing has happened in many, 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 many years. So that's a, that's a very so glaring warning sign. I, there's enormous fight going on in India about which data is right, and the government has a particular view of all data that's inconvenient to it is wrong. But no, no, nonetheless, I think that this is, this is, this is something that uh, I think even the government is increasingly recognizing that there is a problem. So the economy is slowing very, very fast. How fast, we don't know, because there's dispute about data, but I think fast. For the last three decades, the two groups that did relatively well in world economy are the ultra-rich and the ultra-poor. Why are the ultra-poor doing better? Or in part, because some economies are growing fast. In part, also, because, uh, in particular, India and China. But in part, also, because the policies that uh, aim to help the poor cope with the issues that they face have improved. Some of this rigor that we try to develop in the poor countries moves back up north, and we also uh, improve uh, our understanding of what are people's real trouble, our respect for them and their dignity, and uh, therefore, a better, more imaginative solution to solve these issues. Well, the, those assertions uh, by those two uh, wonderful Nobel laureates comes uh, at a time when, and, and they are uh, economists who deal uh, with poverty. It also comes at a time when the Global Hunger Index is out. It's a tool designed to comprehensively measure and track hunger at global, regional, and national levels. It's ranked India at 102 of 170 nations that it looked at. India's performance is significantly worse than other South Asian countries, Nepal, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. Among South Asian countries, India's ranking 102 of 117, Pakistan's ranking 94, Bangladesh's ranking 88, and Nepal's ranking 73 of 117. India has done badly. The report explains India's low rank because of its large population. India's global hunger index indicator values have an outsized impact on the indicator values for the region. But here's a very damaging point. India's child wasting rate is extremely high at 20.8% the highest wasting rate of any country in this report for which data or estimates were available. What is child wasting and what are the four parameters that the report looks like? Undernourishment, it also looks at child wasting, which is the share of children under five years of age who have a low weight for their age. Child stunting, or the share of children under five years of age who have a low height for their age. And child mortality, that rate for children under the age of five. India has performed fairly disastrously. Before we move on to our debate looking at Modinomics versus uh, Nobel economics as espoused by uh, Abhijit Banerjee uh, and the others, let's take a look at some of the main trends as far as Modinomics is concerned and what Nobelonomics, if we can call it, that uh, have focused on. This is basic GST implementation, demonetization, uh, the insolvency and bankruptcy code, the removal of bottlenecks in the infrastructure sector, fighting inflation, widening financial inclusion, and the auction of natural resources in a speedy manner is what this government has based uh, many of its key policies on, its economic agenda on. Those are broad, broad areas which they've looked at. 
But if you look at what Abhijit Banerjee has said as a Nobel laureate, he says the growth is worse than what the government acknowledges. The average consumption expenditure is dropping. Investment has collapsed. Exports are not growing. Public borrowing is up to 10% of GDP. And he says, and I quote, we are in a crisis. That's what we are looking at today. Renu Kohli still with us in the studio. N.R. Bhanumuthi, Professor at the National Institute of Public Finance and Policy with us. Uh, Mihir Sharma, Senior Fellow at the Observer Research Foundation and an economist with me as well. Madan Sabnavis, the Chief Economist of Care Ratings, joins us uh, from Mumbai. And Professor E. Somanathan of the Indian Statistical Institute joins us uh, as well. Um, if you look at what, let, let me come to you first, ma'am. If you look at what Abhijit Banerjee has, has said, uh, do you believe that that is a more clear indicator of the true story and that the government has been talking up growth? The basis of that doesn't exist. Yeah, I think uh, that is certainly true. Growth has been decelerating and it has been decelerating very, very fast. And there has been a kind of a delayed uh, um, acknowledgement of the same. But having said that, and once it has done that, there are, you know, what you call a uh, spate of responses in the last uh, um, uh, six weeks or so, uh, culminating in a large uh, you know, monetary easing by the central bank. But at the same time, uh, I would say that all the responses as, as a kind of a do not strictly correspond one to one as no, to you know, know what exactly uh, is the cause of the slowdown. But uh, the situation is, I think, very, very bad. I'll come to you in a moment, but let me ask you this. A couple of quotes uh, that, uh, that Abhijit Banerjee has made. Um, institution, you, he, he, because he doesn't just focus on, on, on economic numbers. He explains the economic numbers through a certain context. Uh, governance is, is, and institutions is a prism, one of the many prisms that he looks through. So he says, institutions went from hyperactive to zombies. Zombies are the worst because you are now completely frozen in a sense. This is a part of the reason investment has plunged. There is a demand problem. Nobody wants to stick out their neck. They say, no, no, we'll check with the PMO. So an institutional failure. Is that the central hypothesis of Banerjee as far as the India story is concerned at the moment? I think that's um, a large part of, of the story that both he and Raghuram Rajan are telling. Yes. Um, and that is that they believe that part of the reason that there is a, a crisis of investment, which is the reason that we have a slowdown in growth, part of the reason is that there is a lack of faith in institutional independence. And institutional independence is important because if an investor comes in and puts money into India, then they want to feel like institutions will be responsive to their needs and will take their concerns uh, on board. Now. Uh, uh, what this has to do with sort of, you know, more the economics, as you put it, is that uh, there was a belief that having a strong uh, central power, um, in, in this case the PMO, would be able to get us out of the funk of, you know, the weakness of UPA2. However, it turns out that A, the economy is too complex maybe for a single office to run it, in this case the PMO, and B, the PMO itself is so under, you know, le uh, is short on capacity as compared to equ equivalent uh, um, organizations in other countries of, or in other economies of similar complexity that it's simply not able to process this at the, you know, at the bandwidth required. Um, the, thing that's, the things that worked as chief minister don't work as prime minister. You can't be run as a project manager. You have to run, uh, run the country okay. uh, in terms of setting policy and hoping that everybody else down the chain in the union government, which is an enormously complex uh, organism, everybody else follows those policies as you set okay. out. How would you respond to that? Because everything we hear from the finance minister is that macroeconomic basics remain stable in this country, uh, that going forward GDP growth would revive. There are other parameters other than GDP growth we need to look at. Consumption would go up. But then you come out with, the, the, with, with IMF numbers which have just come out, yes. which have pegged growth at 6.1%. So what is the government telling us? Is, is it not true? Is it true at all? Well, I think if you look at uh, today's IMF report, um, where it says 6.1%. In think, line with what the RBI is saying? Yeah, it's with RBI. And if you look at um, uh, the world situation, 
there is a general slowdown in the world economy itself. Even now, with 6.1 percent, India is, would be the fastest growing economy. Uh, I mean, with uh, China growing at the same uh, pace. Now, but the problem, I, th I think, uh, uh, the whole problem has Renu rightly pointed out. The whole problem started with not recognizing the leading indicators early that you know there is going to be a slowdown. I think that really costed us so much, which actually started as a cyclical slowdown. Now it has become structural over a period of time. So, we have been still debating about whether it's cyclical or structural. I think we have to come out of that whole debate. Right now, what we have is a combination of both cyclical as well as structural. So, we need to have uh, responses for both these parameters, both these series, such a way that you address both cyclical as well as structural kind of things. Now, I just wanted to uh, correct one of this modinomics that you have put up. One of the things that this government has done uh, in a very significant way is using the information technology. I think the governance at the rural, I mean at the rural areas actually improved tremendously over the, the past three, four years. That credit should be really given to uh, this And government. you associate that with economic growth? Uh, well, it's you're talking when you are talking about India. inclusive development, when you are talking about inclusive growth, I think I think that needs to be recognized. And again, I will bring the uh, today's IMF report um, where one of the chapters argues for a structural reforms, if at all for India to revive, revive the growth, they talk about the structural reforms. In that, two indicators really stand support. One is the domestic finance issue, the other one is the governance issue. I think in these two aspects. Uh, and they also uh, do some kind of empirical analysis to show that if you address these two issues, you will see a revival okay. in the growth. And I think India has done well in these two uh, okay. indicators. I'll come to you in, in half a second, ma'am. Madan Sabnavis, uh, has India done well as far as governance is concerned? A lot of people would say the lack of governance is why uh, we face so many of these problems which we didn't expect to face so soon into this new government. No, actually, I don't think there's been a governance failure. And I think also what uh, Dr. Banerjee has spoken about is slightly exaggerated. I don't think the Indian economy is doing as badly as it's made out to be. And it's also a fact that I think we all place too much of importance on the government of India to revive the economy. I think the government is the enabler of the economy. And I think if you look in terms of the policies, I think the government has gotten the policy mix right. But I think the problem which is there is that the private sector hasn't quite taken off. And in between, we had the financial yeah, crisis in terms of the uh, Mike NPAs and subsequently we had the NBFC problem which came through. So I think it's one thing to say that the government might have overstated their own role and therefore there were too many expectations built. And in the process, we probably ignored certain uh, uh, factors like what was happening in the rural economy, what was happening at the jobs level. And I think all that has uh, snowballed into consumption coming down, which has affected the uh, okay. Now, I don't think any government can be expected to actually turn around the economy and move the economy from 5% to 7%. It has to come from the private sector. And I think what the government's role is more of an enabler. Now, the thing is that, as I mentioned, the government has been talking a lot about roads being constructed. But we should just remember that the government's contribution to overall capital formation is very, very small. We have around three, three and a half lakh crores, which is being spent on capital expenditure, which definitely cannot move an economy of 210 lakh crores. It has to be done by the private sector. So I don't think there's any problem in governance. It's going to be a very slow process. And I think this happens in all countries. If you go to the US economy, you look at Japan, they've all been taking a lot of time to recover. And you okay. don't see that recovery too. So I think we should be a bit more patient. But at the same time, we should not be thinking that the government is the panacea for all our problems. Government can be a cure only in terms of policies. Rest has to all right. The government has to be an, an enabler. It cannot sort things out by itself. Professor uh, Somanathan, uh, one of the points mentioned in at Brown University a few days back before he won the Nobel uh, is that as far as Professor Banerjee is concerned, we'd, we've got it all wrong in terms of our economic focus. Raise the Mandrega price, raise the prices for farmers, uh, sell public sector banks rather than trying to fix them, uh, let the rupee slide, and then he adds pray, and then in the next slide he says, I think, pray some more. Uh, his vision is, is, is entirely different from what this government does. Uh, is it necessarily an either or sort of situation as we look at both these models? Well, I think that uh, some people have already pointed out that this slowdown has both cyclical and structural components. And one has to deal with both of them. So I think that, uh, for example, the suggestion that uh, that the MG Narega wages should be raised, uh, I think that's a sensible one because 
in this kind of slowdown, you do want to pump up demand. You want to put purchasing power in the hands of people who are going to spend. Um, in that respect, I think that would be a much more effective uh, policy to increase aggregate demand than you know, giving a corporate tax cut, which is what the first thing that the government did. So I think that there is a cyclical component. For that cyclical component, you do need to pump up demand. One way of pumping up demand is to put more money into the hands of the poor in general because they have a higher propensity to spend out of income than the rich, right? Uh, so that's the logic behind that. Okay. I think at the same time, however, that we have to recognize that the structural component is very, very important in the sense that in the long run, we are a very poor country. We should be growing at very high growth rates, mm -hmm. right? Because we are catching up to the rest of the world. So we can grow at a much faster rate than the advanced countries. But in order to do that, our investment has to be productive, right? We have to have a high social rate of return on investment. And the social and private rates of return on investment are not always the same because there are externalities, right? I mean, so the private sector is not going to invest in the education of poor children. It doesn't pay. Right? Okay. The government has to do that and it has to do it effectively. So we have not been good at those kinds of things. We have not been good at the quality of our infrastructure. Sure. I just right? want to uh, so want to bring in of the current. Cr sure. I just yeah. want to bring in Ms. Kohli because I'm uh, running out of time. I, I know you have a point to make. Do make that point. But sure. something else which he mentioned last week. By signaling that the PMO will not interfere with decisions made by professionals and will not reward currying favors and trying to double guess what the PMO would want is something that would be beneficial for the economy in the long run. He basically says you, you have to allow criticism, you have to ensure that, that the PMO is not the one-stop shop and the PMO uh, you reach out to only when you're trying to curry favors. Uh, that institutionally the structure is too central, that's what he's saying. Would you agree yeah, with what he said? I mean, I, w I, I would agree with the fact that it's reasonable and fair to have uh, a lot of uh, debate and discussion because it only enlarges the scope of, your, uh, of everyone's minds and you get, uh, you know, even if you don't, whether you accept uh, those points or not, you, get, uh, you do get, you know, robustness in your decisions. I want to just touch upon this structural aspect and the concept of structural reforms. Now, and, and Modinomics itself. Now, you know, I do not quite know what Modinomics is, but if you look back in the last five years, and this new term has begun just six months ago, uh, well, all the structural reforms that the government uh, has done in uh, Modi 1.0 have been actually textbook reforms, inflation targeting, GST, there was in IBC, enormous support for it. Everybody agreed mm. with it. I mean, I, I personally disagreed and never uh, uh, considered inflation targeting was a good idea. But the question is that these are all textbook reforms which are prescribed and which have been done. The question is now that two years ago, three years ago, we were told when inflation targeting was implemented that it will lay the ground for strong sustainable growth for many, many years to come. What happened to that? We haven't got it. Then again, when the time of a GST was implemented in 2017, there were numerous, you know, research which was saying that it would add additional GDP gains of 1.5 to 2 percentage points. Why have these reforms failed to uh, reap and yield okay. any growth Professor dividend? Professor Manumurthy, would you like to take that on? Why has this failed? No, I think, um, I mean, I completely agree with uh, what Renu is saying, but, you know, if you look at the kind of reform that uh, the government has initiated, like GST, yes. or IBC for that matter, it's still work in progress. I mean, you just don't know what kind of data you are getting. You know, even the GST council, is GST network is still unable to share the data for any kind of uh, assessment of Do you think Professor Banerjee is exaggerated in his views on the Indian economy? Well, when the word crisis, I guess it is slightly uh, exaggerated. A lot more than crisis. He's spoken about zombies which exist. Ah. He's spoken about crisis. He's spoken about uh, us having to pray. He says you have to keep keep praying. He's, he's, he's been fairly harsh in his criticism. You disagree well, with I that? Well, I think a crisis for us, crisis means we, we only remember 1991. I don't think we are anywhere close to that. But in the process, we also face a lot of mini crisis. I guess what we are seeing right now is more of a mini crisis than the kind of thing M that uh, Mini said. crisis or massive crisis? Mihir. Look, when you have a balance of payments crisis like we did in 1991, it's like a, a, a household is getting bankrupt. You know exactly that you're yes. in trouble, right? Because other people are standing at your doorstep and demanding their money back. 
I think the situation that we're in right now is that uh, there's nobody asking for money back. We simply don't have enough money for food. Right. So are you praying or are you praying more? You know, when he, he made that pray and pray more difference, what he was trying to say was, and then this is in the Brown the uh, discussion, that in the short run, you have some things to do to try and fix the immediate problem and pray that they work. And in the long term, you yeah. have other things that you need to do, institutional reform, and then you have to pray that you work, that they work. And, 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 and I think the fact is that we are in something of a hole right now, and we need to address both short-term and long-term drags on growth. And the truth is that even if we, we do our best at this point, we've delayed a lot of things so long that we will need to pray to make sure that they work out. All right. Ma'am, I literally have 15 seconds if you... If you yes, I think uh, what has been missing in this entire discussion, and I haven't read exactly all that uh, Abhijit said at Brown University, is the financial sector issues. Your banks are in trouble, your NBFCs are in trouble, and the question is that this problem has festered for far too long, five years, and then the okay. government resorted to pushing credit through NBFCs. Right. That has collapsed. Both the bubbles have popped. And that, that's a serious crisis, and that contagion is probably sped, spreading to the real economy. That's the most All serious right. thing. All right, so lots of concerns raised over here. Uh, the government's narrative of this completely different. Uh, but I'm out of time. I'd like to thank all of you very much uh, for being with us.